thank you very much for having me. I have heard lots about you. I mean, I'm a nurse uh, Rihanna, she was working with me in the psychiatric unit at Providence, and uh, you guys told her away from us. <laughs> she, she's wonderful, but she's bragging about you, and I, I'm like, I need to come and meet you guys, and thank you for you know, caring about this cause, because it's very, very near and dear to my heart. And this is very personal, the issue of burnout and compassion fatigue and vicarious trauma, all of the consequences that happen because we care about our clients, but also we wear different kinds of hats. We take care of our families, our communities. The only person that we don't feel comfortable talking about and taking care of is ourselves. This is because the culture taught us, if we talk about our emotions, it's a sign of weakness, that uh, we're going to be a burden on others and so on. So hopefully we can break the cycle together. Hopefully this will be part of the culture that we actually practice deep kindness, that we check on one another sincerely, not only superficially. So my name is Omar Rida, I'm a psychiatrist at Providence, St. Vincent. Uh, but I also went through many traumatic experiences in my life, leaving my home country, Libya, in 1999, and living as an asylum seeker in the United Kingdom. And the judge there, he denied my application for uh, becoming a refugee because he said, I failed to see any evidence of physical torture on your body. And I told him, you cannot see my invisible wounds. And this is what trauma does to us. It will really leave psychosocial wounds that we most of the time ignore. And most of the time they are the cause of all of the dysfunction that we see on individual, family, and community level. So uh, you don't have to really write anything in the slides because all of them are available in the book and hopefully you guys uh, will raffle some of the book copies today. But uh, as I said, you know, there is a really heavy price that we pay for caring for others. Many of our loved ones don't understand why we continue to engage with the trauma story, even though it will really affect our soul. Many of us, we develop PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. That's not really mental disorder, it's rather a moral distress. It's a moral injury because we continue to love people and care about them. But yes, I mean, it's a sacred work, it's a beautiful work, it's emotionally rewarding, but it's extremely exhausting. And if we don't pause and reflect and listen to our deep voice, we might actually check out. Some of us, we leave the industry that we once loved. Some of us, we engage in self-destructive behaviors. And some of us, unfortunately, we have lost to suicide. So that's why I really want to talk about this topic and try to break some of these taboos because there is a big elephant in the room that we are ignoring. The trauma story is the big elephant in the room that we should become more comfortable acknowledging at least. So our caregiving is a very lonely experience because people don't understand why we engage in this work because we fear repercussions. Maybe my supervisor will uh, report me to the board, I might lose my license. All of these misconceptions that we have. So we need to build safe spaces in our systems so people can start to feel safe to come, us, come to us and talk. Because one day we will need them and we will go to them to talk about our feelings too. There is nothing shameful about that. So when I started to write my story in the Psychiatric Times, uh, Norton, which is a publishing company, they, they said, Omar, we want you to write this into a book. And I told them, this comes with my own conditions. I want to write a book with soul. And they said, what's your definition of that? I said, I, I want to share human stories. And they told me, absolutely, and we want you to share your own story too. So my story is the last chapter. The book is divided into four chapters. First one, our relationship with our clients. The second, our relation with our families. The third one, our relation with our systems. And the last one, sitting in silence and having an introspection and a deep self-inventory and taking care of our deep wounds, nursing our invisible wounds and so on. So the first question when I wanted to write this book 
uh, in early 2020, it was published only two months ago, I asked the staff, uh, what do you like to read in a book that's written about you? And they had the most amazing answers. One of them, one of the young nurses, she said, I want you to write that as nurses we receive and give love differently. Depends on how burned out we are. I might not have capacity to give anymore if I am completely burned out. So these are some signs that we are going through burnout. If I feel that uh, it's because of my job, that my soul aches, I no longer really care about what happens to my clients. And the work that I do is no longer worth it. So if I don't think that what I do is worth it, I might just leave. And if we lose one of you, we lose lots of good because there are only few people who are doing this important work that we do. So many of us, we come to work hungry, angry, lonely, tired, and scared. Some of us, we will actually start to eat our meals while walking or in the elevator. Uh, I think nurses are very notorious for not taking breaks to take care of their basic human rights, including food and bathroom breaks. Yeah, some of the nurses I work with, they announce their bathroom break. They say, I'm going to the toilet for seven minutes. You know, and people are okay. What if you take ten, 10 minutes, you know, just enjoy your toilet break. <laughs> it's your basic human right. And you know, some of us, we drive dangerously and recklessly because we are sleep deprived. And the most dangerous thing that I always call losing the American dream, chasing the American dream, is the last point, which is we return home with no gas left in us to give to our loved ones. So I spend all of my energy on people in the hospital. Maybe I am kind to my coworkers. Um, maybe the person in the grocery store. But when I arrive home, I don't have any more tank and gas left in my tank. And then my children come to me. They want attention, and they push them away. They grow up, and they come. They want their father, and I push them away. And eventually, it will be too late when. I have time to spend with them. So delaying bonding with your children, a risk that you never bond with them. So make sure that you don't lose the American dream chasing it. Focus on your loved ones. Focus on you, because uh, that's not a luxury. It's a responsibility. Now, many of us, we have thousands of people standing on our shoulders. Uh, so if my foundation is shaky and I'm going to fall, everybody will fall with me. So yes, uh, self-care, it takes time, it takes energy. It should be proactive, not reactive. We should front load this into a daily practice. We don't have to do it in isolation. We can do it also as a community of care. It doesn't have to be a burden, so I don't make it mandatory that you watch this video or you do this training. At the same time, we want not to be neglectful. Yes, not intrusive, but not neglectful, because sometimes uh, our co-workers, when we, we want to reach them, it will be too late. They are no longer reachable. And we have seen that, unfortunately, with some colleagues that uh, died by suicide or completely left uh, the field. If you have fatigue, you no longer have compassion. The minute you take care of your compassion fatigue, the joy of caregiving will come back. Doing a small acts of kindness towards yourself and towards your co-worker and your loved ones, com community members, uh, can really change somebody's day or literally save their lives. Uh, I have seen it with my own eyes. I have seen people actually who are actively suicidal. And then somebody spent a few minutes with them and uh, that changed the outcome. I have seen it with my own children. Uh, you know, my daughter who is, you know, 13 now, she's a very bubbly and happy child. But one day, she was giving us lots of attitude. They say, hey, mama, why are you doing this? Are you doing the same in school? And she said, of course not. I'm like, OK, why, why are you doing this with mom and dad? And she said, maybe because I feel safe at home. I'm like, wow, that's, we have another psychologist in the room. <laughs> but really, children can show us their worst behavior. If they feel safe with us, if they are missing a basic need, if we punish that, because her mom said, just send her on a time out. And I don't believe in time outs, I believe in time in. 
So he said, hey, mama, let us go to your room and talk about this. And the minute she was able to talk about her trauma story, the apple that was stuck in her throat, she was able to digest it with the help of her father. She became very happy and bubbly again. So we can do the same with our co-workers by listening to them, spending a few extra minutes with them. We can do it with ourselves. Every time I pick an apple, a trauma, listening to somebody, I throw it in my backpack and then I complain that my shoulders hurt. I need to lessen my load. Um, many times we have trauma that will steal our voice because the apple is stuck in my throat. So in order to digest it, I need to slowly eat it or get rid of the rotten ones or ask for help. And asking for help is not a sign of weakness. It's actually a sign of courage. And sometimes you need to know the warning signs. If you notice a change in your coworker behavior and their core values, their attitude towards their you know, calling and towards their clients and towards the team. Um, some people are talking about life is not worth living anymore. Some people are actually gaining access to lethal means or engaging and using drugs and substance and so on. All of these can be warning signs that your colleague needs your attention. So, as I said, uh, trauma is the big elephant in the room and uh, hopefully through discussions like these, everybody in the system becomes trauma sensitive, which means when somebody walks through the doors of Adventist, I would say, wow, there is an elephant in the room. We can see the elephant, we're not going to touch it yet. And then through examining our policies and procedures and practices, what do you do when an elephant walks through our doors? Now we start to respond. We start to actually dissect. This is a big elephant. It's a scary. It looks like this. Depends on our own trauma story and our experience with past trauma. We react to the elephant differently. So there is a, like a wonderful movie, which is a child cartoon called Finding Nemo. Yeah. Hopefully everybody loves Nemo as much as I love him. So Nemo's father, even though he's a clownfish, he was not funny because he had trauma. The sharks came and attacked his family and killed his wife and 400 children. Only Nemo survived. And uh, Marlin, who's the father, became extremely protective. He's Nemo, you cannot go to school. You can go after five years from now. You cannot brush your teeth. And Nemo saying, Dad, the ocean is safe. And the father saying, it's not safe. The last time I jumped into the ocean, I lost my family. So there was a conflict, and this is what trauma can do. It can destroy our family unit unless we sit down and talk about the trauma together. It can destroy us as a team unless we sit down and talk about it together. So the minute uh, Marlin was able to confront his own demons, he was able to give Nemo some independence and freedom. And that uh, improved the outcome for everybody. A trauma focused means some of us, for some crazy reason, we love to go and touch the elephant. So we actually engage in trauma focused intervention. And please, if you want to do that, make sure that you have the right training. Good intentions alone are not enough. They can actually backfire. You can do lots of damage. I have seen it in refugee camps and areas affected by wars and disaster. We self-deploy and we think that we are the American experts and we go to a, a different culture, different religion, try to mandate things on them. And that can be very intrusive and dismissive and invalidating. And uh, many times you'll be asked to leave. So make sure you're humble, you have the right training, and make sure this work is emotionally exhausted, exhausting so you don't end up uh, having burnout. And sometimes uh, we have this misperception that there is an unwritten contract I have with Adventists that if I burn out, people will immediately come and check on me and try to take away my pain and suffering. But remember, even your supervisors and your leaders, they have good intention, but they are also extremely stretched out thin. They are burning out too. Everybody is sinking in quicksand so make sure that you take care of yourself. Voice your needs, 
So three things. The first thing is recognize. Recognize that you are very important to the foundation of this system. The second thing, verbalize your needs. So make sure that you're comfortable, respectfully talking about what you need in order to thrive, not only survive. And the last thing is prioritize. Prioritize your self-care. Because uh, people will uh, love to check on you, but they are very exhausted. They are taking care of systems, families, communities, and co-workers, and so on. Uh, most of our healing happens outside the therapy room. So using psychosocial interventions like this one, a check-in on one another is very, very healing. When I went uh, one day to, there are two big organizations, non-government organizations were responding to the Libyan conflict. And uh, they went to my city, Benghazi, and they opened what they called psychosocial clinic. And they invited the staff, come and talk to us. How many staff walked to that clinic? Zero. So people don't really go to the spaces that you uh, will open unless you build safety and trust with them first. And I think the better approach is actually to go to them where they are. Let's share a cup of coffee and donuts and just listen to them in a non-intrusive way. Do it organically. That will be wonderful. And some of us, we have our own trauma. So this is called the ACE, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Score. Many of you, maybe you had some of these traumatic experiences happen to you. Uh, none of these happened to me. Uh, I, my, my trauma happened when I was an adult, when I was forced to leave Libya and uh, live as an asylum seeker, then come to the United States five months after September 11. Young Arab Muslim man coming to America and facing lots of Islamophobia and racism and so on. So make sure that you know uh, that you have your own trauma because maybe when a client is sharing their trauma that will trigger your own wounds and you might respond in ways that will confuse or scare you or maybe your loved ones are walking on eggshells around you because uh, you're acting out your trauma. If you don't have the words for it, you do it through behavior. We have seen that with children and sometimes we shame their behavior, sometimes we punish it and that will just continue this uh, deadly toxic cycle that we are trying to break. So I started in 2011, I uh, you know, created a project called Untangled because I have noticed individuals, families and communities are tangled in the web of trauma. So five components of Untangled. Uh, one is education. What happened to us is abnormal. Our response is normal reaction to abnormal situation. The second one is training, building capacity. The third one is building safe spaces like this one. The fourth is culturally responsive resources. And the last one, some people might need actual psychotherapy or medication management, clinical interventions. Uh, I have done that in Libya, in Syria, in uh, Bangladesh with the Rohingya refugees fleeing Burma. I'm going to do it in Yemen, hopefully, uh, end of the summer. And then some communities here, especially the refugee community in Portland. So being a caregiver is something that will affect our soul. Um, today, I encourage you to take care of your body. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about your mind. Uh, on Wednesday, we talk about the heart. And the last day will be about our soul. But most of uh, our soul ache is a sign that we care about others. And it's uh, really an indication that we need to pause and take care of ourselves. So soul injury can disrupt your deeply held core beliefs. Like the world is a safe place, people should trust people. So when we hurt one another, that's very confusing to our psyche and will make our soul restless. Uh, some people call medicine the industry of suffering. We have seen that very clearly during the pandemic. You guys do wonderful work and especially you've done double of that during the pandemic. Being a family members to people who died without family. It's a very painful experience for everyone involved. So healing is a community responsibility. Hopefully the system is uh, very engaged with the, you know, everybody working in a process of healing. 
as I said, uh, everybody here has a story and it's okay to check on each other and listen to each other's story. And make sure if you don't feel comfortable, you're feeling overwhelmed, know your boundaries, assert your boundaries, and also uh, make sure that you know the resources in the system. So you wanna refer a colleague who's struggling, know the mechanism. The system has some mechanisms that uh, you can use to your advantage. Today, I want you to honor your voice. I want you to know that the caregiving can be a source of pain and suffering, but it can also be the source of joy and delight if you do it right, if you practice self-care. And we know the system is broken. It's not a surprise that COVID-19 showed us how fragile the United States is, and this is not unique to America. Healthcare in every part of the world was almost scandalous, to say it lightly. Um, if you have a tooth pain, that's a sign of infection usually. So if you want to just take an ibuprofen and forget about the infection, you can do that. It's only a band-aid. If your house is on a fire and you don't like the smoke detector, you can take the batteries out but you might die in the fire. So make sure that you really get comfortable listening to your inner voice, uh, console your soul, build your toolkit. Hopefully you can use the Wounded Healer book as an added you know, tool in your toolkit and look with compassion at your own basic needs because you are worth it, because you are the foundation of this system and because you are valued and because do it not only for you, do it for the people that you love. So I think I'll stop here and invite any comments or questions.